Hey everyone, my name is Kevin, and I'm a developer on the Mozilla Virtual Reality team. And before I start talking about A-Frame, which is a library that allows us to build virtual reality, I first want to talk about immersion. So while virtual reality sounds new and it sounds shiny, the pursuit of virtual reality has lasted thousands of years, dating back to the very first cave paintings. These were the very first immersive images that gave the inhabitant the sense of entering another world. And since then, the medium of immersion has only evolved throughout human history, from those cave paintings to um, art to books to, and up until more recently, video games. And video games over the last 30 or 40 years have really pioneered the art of immersion. And fast forward to 2016, and the very first virtual reality headsets are shipping. Earlier this year, Samsung Gear VR shipped, and in a matter of weeks, Oculus will ship their very first headset to consumers. And then soon HTC and Sony and Microsoft will join the arms race. We never really needed virtual reality goggles um, to experience immersion. We've all read a book that we've been totally sucked into, or we've been totally engrossed by a movie, or we spent hours on end playing video games and feeling as if we were in another world. Uh, games like Minecraft or movies like Mad Max or books like Harry Potter. Uh, Harry Potter. But how many of you have here, by a show of hands, how many of you have tried a virtual reality headset? All right, so that's almost half the room. And how many of you have tried WebVR? All right, just a few of you. So this talk is kind of an extension of the future of immersion panel. Um, so for those of you who have tried virtual reality headsets, you know that the sense of immersion it gives you, it trumps all previous forms of 2D mediums. The sense of emotion it can give you, it's very hard for 2D mediums to touch that level. You might have seen reactions like this. It's, I've never seen anyone have this reaction to a 2D medium. And I've witnessed this firsthand. I give a lot of VR experiences to my wife, and I've seen her come out of headset with tears literally streaming down her face. And because she's just so overwhelmed and enthralled by the sense of immersion. And in one case, I gave her a Samsung Gear VR to try out, and it was an ocean experience where you float around the ocean and you try to find uh, marine life. So I found some dolphins, I gave it to her and say, hey, check this out. And then a minute later, I hear a scream. And I'm like, what's wrong? They're just dolphins. What's so scary about dolphins? And it turns out, I was like, no, I saw a shark, and she's like in the blankets and all scared and stuff. And it turns out she actually needs to switch to the shark experience. So I've seen emotions of joy and fear and sadness and surprise that virtual reality has brought us. So with this new sense of presence, where does the web fit into virtual reality? We're at 4JS right now, and we're kind of talking about the future of the web. And there's not much more future than talking about virtual reality. So where the web fits into this and how we can all start building virtual reality today is what my team has been working on for the past, over the past year and a half. So MozVR is a small research group under Mozilla. And it was started over a year ago by Josh Carpenter, who's sitting in the room. And they wanted to answer, is the web viable platform for virtual, rea for virtual reality? And It's a web a, a viable platform for, for virtual reality, and yeah, how can we enable that? So our engineering director at Firefox, Vlad Vukicevic, and Brandon Jones, a software engineer over at Google, they both collaborated on an initial spec of the WebVR API, and they got together, and they released initial nightly versions of Firefox and special builds of Chromium. And this was kind of the starting gun for WebVR. Um, it allowed people to start playing with WebVR instantly. So this is just a web page, a web page that you could just re reach out and grab and touch and kind of feel like you're in this 3D virtual space. And one minute you could be flying over the Arctic Circle, and the next second you could be hovering over a mountain pass. So we can all, so it's possible to do today, but how do we start doing it? It requires a lot of graphics knowledge and 3D knowledge. And for web developers, it's just too hard to create web VR experiences. 
the skill gap to create a 3D experience, it's disjoint from the skill, the skill set that web developers have. You need to know a lot about shaders and graphics and um, 3D programming. And that's not something that web developers encounter, in, encounter often. So what Mozilla Virtual Reality Team wanted to do is wanted to unlock this group of millions of web developers and give them the creative potential that a small group of really hardcore graphics programmers have today. So rather than writing lots of 3JS code and having to have lots of knowledge about graphics or 3D engines and such like that, instead we wanted to just do something like simple, something like a box or a sphere or a OBJ model. And this is something we're all accustomed to as web developers and web designers. It says HTML syntax, and it's just, that's just as basic as it gets. And then we can just pass attributes to these elements. So we can give depth, shape to the box. We can give a color to the sphere. Or we can specify a path to some 3D model that was exported from Blender or SketchUp. So last holiday, we released this library, and we called it A-Frame. So A-Frame is an open source framework that allows us to create virtual reality web experiences. And you don't have to know any WebGL to get started. And even more, you, in most cases, don't even have to know JavaScript. And interesting to note, that logo is written complete in A-Frame, just in HTML. Since then, the community has well received this new library. They've been creating really cool things. And every day when we go to work, people are sharing a new thing. And we try it, and we get really excited. Most of these scenes, they're just using markup, no JavaScript at all, from people that don't even know JavaScript. And they've created scenes such as Tron, such as visualizers or tunnel riders, or even copying Minecraft. They've created using elements such as this. So A-Frame comes, A comes with out of the box elements that allow you to get up and running really fast. And these elements, such as a image or a video sphere or geometric primitives such as a box, they can be manipulated using just vanilla JavaScript that in these interfaces that we already know. So you can do your standard query selectors, your get attributes. You can do set attribute, or you can add event listeners and create elements. And as a result, we can use all the libraries, frameworks, and tools that we all know and love. Or, yeah, so we can use jQuery. It works with D3, and it works pretty well with React. A-Frame also has an animation system. And this is sort of based off the smile spec and the web, web animation spec. So you just specify an animation as a child of the, the 3D object, and you just get animations right, right out of the box. And this is, uh, we're using, we're using tween.js under the hood. And also worthy to note that we have an asset management system under works. So in 3D programming and game development, it's important to have all your assets loaded up front. So you're not trying to fetch and render, not trying to fetch and load assets while you're rendering, because that's a uh, big perfect. So we're trying to address that concern, because the number one uh, priority in virtual reality on the web is performance. So that's a lot of information taken, even though it's pretty basic and pretty high level. What we can get started with is just a live coding session. So we can go over to Vim here. And I have a boilerplate set up. Uh, that's cut off. Drag it over. Is that big enough for everyone? OK. So I have a boilerplate set up. And it's worth to note that Throughout this presentation, I'll be talking about our next release of A-Frame, which will be coming up. And it will be called 0.2.0. And I'm using kind of a beta special build for this presentation, because I want to show off features that is not yet released. So we, have, we start with A-Scene. And A-Scene is just the container for our 3D world. It does a lot of magical things, such as setting up the renders and the VR renders, and the render loop, and if needed, default camera and lighting systems. So let's start off with adding a sky. 
which, is, which will act as our background. So we can just specify a source, just like as we do with image tags. And I have an image already taken. I took a trip to Hong Kong a couple months ago, and I brought around a 360 camera. So I have some pictures already ready to view in virtual reality. Let's move this here. It's not really centered. OK. So this is just looks like an image, but I can actually just pan around here and look around this environment. And this is just one line of markup. So you can have 360 photos in just one line. And the 3GS equivalent would probably be, with VR, at least 150 lines. Um, also to note that I didn't realize that I needed an HDMI cable with the to do the presentation. And the Oculus Rift also need an HDMI cable. So I couldn't really demonstrate VR. But you can imagine, if I moved this headset over here and I rotated it, the camera would rotate one to one with, the, uh, with the, your head. All right, so one problem is that I don't really want to face this way. I kind of want to face towards the point of interest here. So this is all a right-handed coordinate system. And if you can imagine, um, the y positive y-axis is pointing up. The positive x-axis is pointing to the right. And the positive z-axis is pointing, I think, outwards. So if we want to rotate the sky, we just rotate it in this kind of direction. And that would be about the positive y-axis. So what I can do is I can just add a rotation. And this takes an x, y, and a z value in degrees. So I want to rotate it 90 degrees. Save that. And, and now we're kind of facing in the general direction we want. And I'm just going to tilt the horizon a bit just to get it a little bit straight. So I'm just going to modify the roll here by negative 2 degrees. And that's a little bit more straight. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add an object to the scene. So in web development and in web design, we make heavy use of images. So let's try adding an image in. So I have an image already, and I'm just going to pre-position it. This is also with an x and y, x, y, z coordinate. Um, back negative 3, up negative 3. That's probably a PNG file. That's web development. That is truly web development. So I'm just going to skip that for now, since it doesn't seem to be rendering. But I'm also going to try to render a 3D object file. So I grabbed a 3D object file from 3D Warehouse. And since Lunar New Year was a couple days ago, I'm going to kind of celebrate the new year, Lunar New Year by celebrating the year of the monkey. So I have a monkey file set up, a monkey object. And I can just specify the source and point to the monkey 3D file. And then I, I'm also just going to quickly specify the color here. And I'll explain the syntax later on. So I'll just give it kind of a reddish color or brownish color. And I can actually specify how metal it is. So that will affect how the light hits it. And just close the tag. So that doesn't look like a monkey. And it turns out just because I grabbed it straight from the online on the internet, it doesn't really fit well within my scene. So I need to shrink it down a little bit. What I can use is what can I do is I can use a web inspector, just as we do in normal web development. I can go through the scene. It's a little bit small, but I'm just gonna select the OBJ model that I just did. And I'm just gonna add a, I'm just gonna try to scale it down with the scale component. So I can do scale. And I'm going to make it a 1,000 times smaller. And now we kind of see a little monkey statue. And that fits very well with our scene. So I'm just going to save that value. Oops. So uh, 1,000 times smaller on the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. All right. And I'm going to close the dominant inspector. So in Chinese New Year, the tradition is that you give lucky money to people in order to wish them prosperity. 
And we're going to do the same with the monkey. The monkey is kind of holding a pot out, so we're going to try to give it money. Um, so we're going to try to create a dollar bill using a box, and we're just going to make the box really thin and really long. And we're going to try to position it within the pot. It's going to depend on critical accuracy here. So I can do a box, and I can specify the def to be four. I got these values all hopefully memorized. The width to be very thin, and then the height to be about half the depth. And I need to position it a little bit outwards. Thank you. Positon. OK. Uh, so we can kind of see a sliver of the dollar bill, because it's not rotated in the correct direction. So I'm going to tease a tool that one of our team members have been working on for the past couple months. It's kind of annoying to go back and forth and find the right value, save it, and fiddle. So what we have is we have a bookmarklet. I'm just clicking a bookmarklet in my bookmark toolbar right here called Editor. And that injects a button to the bottom of my page. And I can actually click Edit and go into sort of a WYSIWYG tool and zoom in and out. So if I want to rotate this box, I can just kind of click the box. And it brings up handles, which I can use to drag the box around. So I can try to rotate the box here so that it's kind of facing towards the camera a little bit more. And just to show that it's actually live, I can move the monkey around using these handles. And if I go back into the view, you can see the monkey has kind of been translated. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to take those values and save it into my HTML file. OK. And the monkey's not very happy with this little piece of gray slap that doesn't really have any currency value. So I'm just going to give it a texture. So I can specify an image as a texture, and it'll be mapped to the geometry. So I have an image already called money. And I'm just going to specify it as a white color so the color of the material doesn't bleed through. And then we have a dollar bill. So the web VR doesn't really work because I only have one HTML port. So this would actually be a good opportunity to show off you. You could try it yourselves right now. So what you can do is, after I get back in here, since the web is meant to work everywhere, is we're all accustomed to that. The web works on desktop. The web works on phone. And just with VR, with VR it also works on phone with A-Frame. So we're using the web VR polyfill to enable this. And I'll just let you all try it for yourselves. So I posted a link on my Twitter, um, no Kevin with an underscore. And that will link to the live version of that site. And you'll actually be able to move the phone around and view it in 3D space. So I'm going to give everyone a minute to try that. And I'm just going to stand over here for a bit. Or if you have a laptop, you could also pull it up and try it as well. So for those who do got it working, or for those who just um, it works, cool. So for those who did got it working, or for those who are just kind of sitting and chilling, if you move the phone around, you can see yourself in um, moving panning around the 3D scene. And this is what Google Cardboard kind of if is kind of compatible with. You can press the goggles and get a stereoscopic view. You could plop into Google Cardboard, and then you could kind of view it in sort of a 360 view. Responsiveness, responsiveness is awesome. All right. So that was a high-level overview of A-Frame. I'm going to start talking more about the internals of A-Frame and how it sort of the internal engine of it or the core system of it. So if we want to bring 3D and virtual reality to the web, we're going to need to adopt 3D and game development patterns that have been established over the years. So 
A-frame exposes in any component system pattern. And this is a pattern common in game, de um, game development. It's used in universal game engines such as Unity. And what it does is it favors composability over inheritance. So what this means is instead of building a class for every single type of object that you want to create, you just kind of create reusable components such as color or light or engine or tires. And then you kind of snap together these components like Legos and build, con like build objects. So if we wanted a car, we would just take the tire component, the color component, the light component, the engine component, and we would configure the components, and then we would put them together. And if we want the bike, we would just exclude the engine. And say if we wanted a boat, we just exclude the wheels. And that's kind of an abstract way to think about the ND component system. In more definitive terms, the ND component system is where entities are just placeholder objects in the scene. So you can imagine them as an object with a bunch of little sockets. And then we take these components and we plug them into the sockets in order to the modify the appearance, the functionality, and the behavior of it. Because without components in the system, the entity doesn't do anything and it doesn't render anything. And this allows us to really reuse code and be able to make more types of objects using just a limited number of components. So all the elements I showed you before, like a box, that actually expands to a entity, which is our representation of the entity in markup. And all the elements, all the attributes that we showed before, such as width or color, those map to component properties. So the width would actually be a would actually map to the geometry's components width property, and the color maps to the material component's color property. To see this more in action, we can compose an entity. So we have an entity by itself, does nothing. If we want to give it shape and uh, appearance, we could add the geometry and material components. And each component has lots of different properties in themselves, so it's very customizable. If we want to have it do more things, we could have it emit light or play sound. And if we want to get crazy, we could pull components that other people have created and just use them on our entity. So if someone made a physics, uh, we could add physics to make it, have it be affected by gravity. Or maybe someone created an aggro component that makes it attack the player. Or maybe it can explode or vibrate. And with all the components that we ex expect people to create and all the number of components in the ecosystem, if you permutate all the components that are out there, you kind of have a virtuous, uh, you kind of have a uh, virtually infinite number of types of objects that you can create. And you don't have to, and this is kind of contrasting to an inheritance, inheritance system or a hierarchical, hierarchical system, where for each class you extend from a different class and you pull in lots of different classes and then you end up having a big tangle of hierarchy. So to see the inside of a component and how it's created, I'm going to explain one of our most simple components, which is position. So we can use A-frame to register a component, and then we just pass the position name, or the component name, and the component definition. So the anatomy of it is, is the schema. That's the shape and the data of the component, and that defines um, the type of the data, uh, how many different properties there are, how the data is deserialized and serialized to and from the DOM. And the physiology, or how the component works, you can define it with lifecycle handler methods. So you can define an update handler method, which um, uses the data to manipulate the 3D object. So the component has a reference to the element, and then that element has a reference to its internal 3JS object 3D. I don't know if I mentioned it, but A-frame runs on top. It's like an abstraction layer on top of 3JS. So we just take the object 3D's position and we pass the data in. So most components will be interacting with the 3JS API. A-frame comes with a bunch of standard components out of the box. 
and by themselves, those are fairly useful. Um, but if you find something that A-Frame can't do or is limited because the core team hasn't developed a component for it, you can just write your own component. And within the last two months, we've seen people write a handful of components that enable a lot of cool things. Our community has been really, really hardcore, and they've really dug down to the system, and they just get really excited, and they just uh, build cool things. They don't let obstacles get in their way. So they built, comp uh, they built components such as proxy controls that allow you to use the uh, phone on your face, and then you can attach a gamepad to it using uh, WebRTC or WebSockets, rather. And lots of components for different types of geometries and controls and components to explode things, collide things, or load 3D objects. So the component ecosystem is kind of the core tenant of A-Frame. Um, it enables permissionless innovation. So uh, developers, they develop components and that enable other developers to create really cool scenes. And they kind of just drive each other. So we saw the syntax earlier. It was kind of like a style-like syntax where you specify, um, it's kind of like CSS, where you specify a rule and then a value. And to some people that you kind of like cringe at that. And, but with new libraries, you kind of introduce new concepts. I mean, when React first came out, people were like, that's HTML inside your JS. That's like PHP all over again. But this is kind of an elegant design. You can actually just uh, specify, uh, to overcome the longhand syntax, you can just specify mixins, which take components and store them, and then you can use them later on. So if I have a mixin called green and a mixin called ball, later I can just use an entity green ball. And here's where the composability story comes back into play. You can compose these mixins and create to create different types of objects. And it creates it's actually kind of like English. So you can say green ball or shiny ball, shiny green cube, shiny green ball, shiny yeah. So with just those four alone you can create a handful of different objects. And I can imagine with this mixing system, since that's kind of like the analog to the style element where you specify inline CSS. I can imagine later on we could have something like style sheets. So you, maybe later on we could specify a mixin as what we now specify as a selector. And within that selector or rule group, we just specify components. And here's a, like a basketball component. So maybe in the HTML, I just specify mixin equals basketball. And this is what we're all accustomed to as web developers. We like to separate the concerns between uh, the presentation and the structure of the DOM. And in this case, we're separating the presentation, the appearance, the functionality, the behavior, and we're separating it from the st uh, 3D structure of the scene. So that was a really quick run through of A-Frame. A and it's important to note why A-Frame is important. It's going to enable um, the, the web VR ecosystem to create content. and because we don't really know what's going to be in the future of WebVR. We don't know what 3D browsing is going to look like in the future. So we need content for people to validate the ideas and iterate and see what works and see what doesn't. And I also like to note that A-Frame isn't the first of its kind. There has been other markup or declarative-like libraries out there. Um, Tony Parisi's VRML was the very first of its kind, and it was 20 years behind this time uh, because it was so early. Uh, and then that manifested now into Glam. And then there's also inspirations taken from libraries such as X3DOM. And we just wanted to kind of do our own take on it and um, kind of introduce this to any component system, which we think is really nice. So with this, we're, we're hoping to enable this mass of web developers to create tons of content. And we want to learn from the web developers because the web developers, they're going to create the interaction models that we don't know about yet. We don't know what's going to be the next hamburger menu. We don't know what's going to be the next drop-down accordion menu. And maybe in the future, maybe it'll actually be an actual hamburger. You can actually have a 3D scene, and you can just open up the hamburger or play an accordion for the drop-down menu. Uh, so together, we can kind of, um, or before I get into that, 
uh, we, I'm going to throw up some links up here, and I'll give some time for people to process that. We have a really active Slack community. We have over almost 300 people in less than two months, and they're all actively sharing things and bouncing ideas off each other and asking questions, which is really nice. Uh, we have the official A-Frame site and the A-Frame GitHub repo. And then the team site is at mozvr.com. So if we keep developing the future of the web, maybe one day we'll start to get science fiction. And I forgot to mention this before, but the strengths of the web, why are we talking about virtual reality with the web? It's not doing virtual reality just in the web, just for the sake of doing it in the web. It's not just JavaScript just for the sake of JavaScript. Um, the web has inherent strengths that could really benefit the medium of VR in the future. Um, strengths such as um, the ability to publish anything you want, the ability to go from world to world without any gatekeepers, um, the ability for us to really easily, uh, really, really easily develop content. And just as today we click on a link and we jump from page to page, you can imagine one day we might jump from world to world. And the current state of VR today is it's a lot of different headsets from a lot of, a lot of different companies. Um, they all have their own siloed ecosystems. And all these apps in the ecosystems, they have no, really aware, no real awareness of each other. If VR is more webby, we can start to converge on something that's been described in science fiction uh, within the past 50 years, yeah, the metaverse. So the metaverse is this idea that we have this shared collective virtual space that we can jump into and interact with the 3D environment, see each other, and be able to hop from world to world. And with the web, that sounds pretty natural, hopping from world to world. Um, so if you combine the web and VR, you kind of naturally get something like the metaverse. And it's been tried a couple times. Um, Janus VR and Allspace are doing something very much like the metaverse. And they're producing a really cool product, and, but they don't have to really worry about web standards, so they can move really fast. Uh, for A-Frame, we kind of do have to f think about the future of the web. So yeah, so everyone can go out there today and grab A-Frame and try to start building the virtual reality web. Get on Slack, talk with us, and together we can maybe make science fiction. Uh, I got about, I think, a couple minutes. I can answer questions if you have any. Yeah. OK. So she asked, how did we map that texture to the dollar bill in the monkey example? Um, so in, we have a 3GS. Uh, we're going to 3GS. So all we tell 3GS to do is take this image and map it to this mesh or this, this polygon. And un underneath that, it just, the shader just takes an image, and it does lots of um, deep down magical stuff to kind of map it around the, the object. Does that answer your question? Or? I told him to do some of the deep down stuff. I told him to do the 3D art OK. I told well, what's interesting is I've only been doing this for about four months, and that's kind of a test to how easily this makes uh, 3D and virtual reality development. So, so that hasn't been done yet, but I can imagine someone creating something like Bootstrap where they release a library that has a lot of default mix-ins and a lot of a nice default appearance. And then I imagine people could just be able to pull those down. And similarly with style sheets, I imagine in the future, people will be able to share these groups of mix-ins with each other. Um, but for now, um, I haven't seen that yet, so you, you kind of write your own mix-ins. Yeah. Uh, do you want an interactive scene? Is that the question? Um, so yeah, you could. I didn't show it off, but we do have a cursor component, which shoots a ray caster. And what a ray caster is, it, it kind of shoots a laser from the middle of your head. And if you, whatever it intersects with, whenever you trigger a click event, it will trigger a click event on the entity. And there's also an interaction model called gaze-based cursor. And what it does is if you stare at something long enough, it will trigger a click, or also called fuse-based cursor. So that's a way to click without having to need a mouse. Yeah. Uh, it's something to add for the interactivity? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so leap motion, 
there's a video earlier that it shows that it can be done with WebVR, so you could actually just reach out and touch things. Um, I think they're working. I, I think Leap Motion's controls will be coming to A-Frame pretty soon. Uh, people are writing components for it. So you could actually just map all five fingers and uh, detect collision events with objects in the scene. All right. All right, the question session is five minutes over, so everyone's, I don't want to take anyone's time, so everyone's free to go. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>